JJ wanted to meet with me. We, we met up at a cafe uh, in town, and uh, I remember sitting, reading on his iPhone, the new Star Wars movie, while he was just sitting in front of me at this cafe in Paris. It was just incredibly surreal. Drive. Yeah, that was with Nick Reffin. We met at a NoHo Star. We went to that restaurant there. And uh, I was actually coming to tell him that I wasn't going to do the movie. When I had read the script, I remember feeling that the character of Standard was standard. And he said, well, if it could be anything you wanted, what, what would it be? What would it be? If you could just, we could just make it up. And so then we sat there for four hours, I remember, in this restaurant, and we just went through it and just kind of spitballed and came up with all these ideas of like, well, what if he was owning his own bar and he, you know, decided to be, he made a mistake because he kept some money that he shouldn't have and now he's in jail and now he then he's got to, has to pay for protection and slowly this whole thing just spirals and spirals out of his control. And I think ultimately it made it a, just a much more complex situation because suddenly you did feel a little bit for the guy and so once he comes out of prison, you know, suddenly this triangle gets much more complex. So you've been uh, coming around helping out a lot? Is that right? Mm-hmm. Oh. That's very nice. That's nice of you. Thank you. I also remember on set, just Nicholas Reffin, he would always wear a blanket around his midsection because that's where he kept the energy warm. It was from Nick Reffin that, um, and I, I keep this with me all the time now, because he says, he's like, you know, whenever it says in the script, the guy comes through the door, I wonder why doesn't, why doesn't he come through the window or up through the floor or break through a wall? And, uh, and so he kind of goes through all the different choices of what it's not to get back to why it has to be this one. And that's something that I've always kind of kept with me, that idea of like, well, what else could it possibly be? Inside Lewin Davis. That was the kind of the thing that changed everything. I remember I was doing a movie in Pittsburgh and I was pretty bored. And so I started just playing a lot of guitar. I'd, I'd always played guitar, but this time I just really became much more serious about it. And I started finding open mics in the area uh, and I would go and I'd play. And then a few months later, I get this audition for the Coen Brothers where I had to play some songs. All, everything that happened to get to this part was just so crazy. Like I was, then I was doing this other film after I knew that I had the audition coming up, and there was a guy that was a featured extra, he was an old guy at the end of the bar, and there was a guitar laying around, and he picked up the guitar, and he started playing it exactly in this style. It was Travis picking, and he was amazing. He was so good. His name's Eric Franson, and I said, Hi, you're amazing. How do you, 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 you play a lot? He's like, oh yeah, I've been playing all my life. Do you give lessons? He's like, yeah, I actually give lessons all the time. And I said, oh, because I'm on audition for this thing uh, that's kind of based on Dave Van Ronk. Do you know Dave Van Ronk? He's like, yeah, I played with Dave. And so I was like, got chills, and I was like, well, I, I need to learn how to play, can you teach me? Like, yeah, yeah, so I go to his place, and he lives right above the old Gaslight, he's been there for years, and it looked like a time capsule, he had all these old guitars everywhere, and records, and he just started playing me record after record, and teaching me how to play in this Travis Bacon. This was just for the audition, you know, I hadn't even gotten the part yet. Then I got it, and, and, um, and it was the most incredible experience of my life. Lay cold as a stone I don't see a lot of money here. You know, Joel and Ethan, they, they kind of always operate from this place of whoever feels the strongest wins. Someone feels very strongly that that shouldn't be the shot. There'll always be one guy that's like, no, it definitely shouldn't be that. And the other guy's like, all right, cool. And every once in a while, like they'd come up and, and you know, Joel would come up and give me a direction, and then he'd leave. And then Ethan would come up and give me a direction. Sometimes it was a different direction. So I would just do what the last guy said. The whole thing was just like the biggest education I could possibly ever get. They were just so generous with like their knowledge. And at the same time, didn't give any compliments. So that kind of really taught me to really just, just stay within myself and not to look for anything from them. Because whenever they'd come up, you know, it's like if it was good, they'd just come up and go, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and then if it wasn't good, they'd go, yeah, yeah. And I'd be like, got it, I got it, just, we'll, do it we'll do it again. The most violent year. That was particularly cool because it was right down the street from where I live, where mostly where we were shooting, so I could just walk to work every morning. It was also the coldest winter in, in years and years. You know, underneath that big camel coat and those you know perfect Armani suits, I was wearing you know a, a flesh-colored uh, <laughs> diving suit to keep me warm. 
And that was really great, particularly because of Jessica Chastain, who I went to school with, and we went to Juilliard together. And she's the one that really kind of championed me for the role. Uh, you know, I remember it was like a very, you know, debonair, very well put together guy. And at this, at the time, I was just finishing shooting Ex Machina. And when I, when I met with JC, I was I had a shaved head and a huge beard, and he was like, I don't know if this is the guy, man. <laughs> What is that? It's a gun. It's a fucking gun. There's so much ambiguity in it, which I really loved. You know, it was a it was a gangster movie, but without the gangsters. You know, it was it was about violence, but lacking violence. It was a really challenging challenging thing to play because everything was so close to the vest. Everything was just this kind of internal volcano that was brewing inside that re rarely ever had a moment to to be let out. Um, but doing those scenes with Jessica was just so, so much fun because we were, we're very similar animals. Ex Machina. One of the very first auditions I had when I graduated from school was for a movie called Sunshine that Alex Garland had written. And I remember reading the script and I just, I, w I became so obsessed with it. After I didn't get the part, I still would go back and read it and I had all these ideas for music and I remember being like, is there a way that I can get these people my ideas? Because I've got some really great thoughts about this thing. Uh, but that's how much of an impression that the script had made on me. Years later, he was directing his first film officially. I went to, uh, into this hotel to meet him. I remember as I was going in, I saw a number of actors leaving. So it was like this speed dating thing that he was doing. <laughs> and there was like, oh, oh, hello, oh, you, yeah, yeah. Big, big fan. And then I'd go in to go and talk to him. We sat down and I immediately started talking about Sunshine. I'm also qu quite a bit of a nerd. And so, you know, I thought a lot about consciousness and what consciousness means and particularly in terms of artificial intelligence. And we just sat for a few hours and, and just talked and talked about all the possibilities and how, you know, how you would play a character like this. The, the fact that within the movie itself, this guy is playing a role. He has to portray someone that's a very specific character in order for the experiment to go the way he wants it to go. But also at the same time, you know, he kind of goes method with it a little bit and he goes so deep in that at, at a certain point, you know, where is the role that he's playing and where, where is he really? Because he, he is a nihilist. He knows that the singularity is coming, that it's going to be the end for us. It's just a matter of when. And if it's not him, somebody else is going to figure this thing out. Ava, I said stop. And then I forget exactly why I went down this road with it, but I just thought of Stanley Kubrick a lot. Someone that was also quite mysterious and a genius and brilliant. So I listened uh, over and over to this one um, recording, an interview of his from, I think it was the, the late 50s. And so there was something about his voice that I really liked. And so I started trying to play with that voice. And I actually used the glass, the kind of same shape glasses that he had. So for me, it was really, it was Kubrick and then a lot my, my father. <laughs> my dad's a doctor and he's an incredibly intelligent guy, but he's got a, you know, a strange spiritual aspect to him as well. And it's fun because my dad came to visit and there's a really great picture of me and him playing chess on the set in the corner. And he's got a beard and glasses and, you know, uh, not shaved head, but... Those were kind of the two people that I really thought of. Star Wars The Force Awakens. I was doing uh, Most Violent Year, and I found out that J.J. wanted to meet with me for a part, and that I needed to fly to Paris. And I remember, I actually still have the voice message saved, because I remember uh, in between shooting, I got a message from an unknown call, a caller, and it was a voice that was like, hey, Oscar, it's JJ. You know, you don't have to come all the way out to Paris. What are you going to do, play a droid? You don't need to be doing that. Actually, this is Albert Brooks, because uh, Albert was in the, in the movie. So he really had me going for a second there. Uh, and I'm very happy that I still have that voice message. But yes, so I, then I ended up going out to Paris, and I met with him and Kathy Kennedy and Lawrence Kasdan. And we sat in an office, and they pitched me a story. It's like this heroic guy, he's the first person, he's in the crawl, you know, they describe him, he's, he's Leia's like number one pilot, and he shows up, and you have a scene with Max von Sydow, and, and then and the, the main bad guy shows up, and then, and then you die, spectacularly. I thought, oh, I just, I've done that so much, where, you know, you, you set up the main story for the, the main characters, you know, so, and then Kathy, to her credit, she was like, yeah, yeah, you did that for us in the Bourne, Bourne movie. I was like, yeah. And I was like, but but let, uh, let me let me think about it. 
And then I went home and uh, kind of thought about it. And I thought, you know what, I gotta do this, I gotta do it. And then when I called him to let him know I wanted to do it, he said, actually, we're changing it up. He's in the whole movie now. It's gonna be really cool. You completed my mission, Finn. That's my jacket. Oh, oh. No, 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 no. Keep it, it suits you. And I flew to London and I, I read with John Boyega and that was the first time that I'd met him. And the very next day we were doing the, the the reading where we were all sitting in a circle and reading the new Star Wars movie. Star Wars The Last Jedi. For The Force Awakens, uh, you know, it was it was such a new thing. Uh, it was an incredibly huge moment. So there was just a, a, a very intense, intense energy. It was excited, but it just was, there was a vibration to the whole thing, you know, and there was a, every single thing was so thought out and so, uh, orchestrated because it meant so much. In the second one, uh, you know, Ryan came in, he was very laid back. I always describe him as like a, a West Coast jazz musician, you know, just kind of boop, 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 he's really cool and come up and very quiet and soft spoken and humble and has like, I had like a childlike wonder about the whole thing. Let's go, BB 8, it's now or never! <laughs> And for me, you know, I, I got to, to work with Laura Dern, who's one of my favorites, and, uh, and that, was a, that was a fun thing to do and challenging as well. Um, so yeah, it, was a, it had a very different energy, the whole thing. But yeah, I, was, uh, I really, really like Ryan. Next but Apocalypse. Apocalypse, that was excruciating. I didn't know <laughs> when I said yes that that was what was going to be happening, that I was going to be encased in glue and latex and in a 40 pound suit that I had to wear a cooling mechanism at all times. I couldn't really move my head ever. You know, I was like, oh, I get to work with these like great actors that I like so much, but I couldn't even see them because I couldn't move my head and I had to like sit on a specially designed saddle because that's the only thing I could really sit on. And then I'd just be put, I would be rolled into a cooling tent in between takes. And so I just wouldn't ever talk to anybody and I would just kind of be sitting and I couldn't really move and like sweating inside the mask and the helmet. I'm not here for them. I'm here for you. And then I was also in high heels inside of a boot. So that was very difficult to move at all. And uh, every time I moved, it was just like rubbers and plastic squeaking. So everything I said had to be dubbed later as well. And then the getting it off, was the worst part because they just had to kind of like scrape it off for hours and hours. Um, so that was X-Men Apocalypse. Annihilation. That was a crazy experience because I was shooting at Last Jedi exactly at the same time and on the same lot in Pinewood. So I would go back and forth while I was doing Star Wars into that really intense, dark, dark world. And that one had a, because of the, there's a lot of found footage elements to it that had a real looseness to it as well. So we would just play around with what that was. And oftentimes it would be Alex that was operating a camcorder or a flashlight and just kind of really getting in there. That particular scene was pretty astounding because uh, they had, you know, they actually made it practical. There was like a practical effect. They had kind of made this torso for the guy and the flap that opens up and there was someone behind them just pulling all like the intestines and stuff. And I just remember, again, thinking of my father a bit. And I remember, cause afterwards he even pointed that out, that there was like the awe of, of like cutting somebody open and seeing something, you know, like, which made it more horrible as opposed to me being kind of horrified by it. I was like, look, there it is. You know, there was like an excitement to it, which just made it all the more disquieting. So that, that's something that Alex and I talked a lot about in that movie. It's like, how do you make what's there just slightly off so it just really creeps you out? Yeah, that was, uh, it was dark stuff. But I, I, I love, love that movie. <laughs>